like I said, the court heard two challenges to the Texas law today. The first was from a clinic that provides abortions in Texas. The second was from the U.S. Justice Department. The Justice Department's case was um, argued by the brand new Solicitor General of the United States, Elizabeth Preliger. And because the, the, the Justice Department went second, she had the benefit of having the last word today as the justices consider both of these challenges to Texas's ban. Both the Texas Clinic and the Justice Department are asking the court to allow their challenges to the Texas law to go forward, to, to ignore Texas's claim that, you know, having vigilante random citizens enforce this thing means that this thing is insulated from federal court review. But this is how she closed the arguments today. Listen to her explain to the judges the implications if they side with Texas instead. The final point is to just step back for a moment and, and think about the startling implications of Texas's argument here. The, across the arguments this morning, Texas's position is that no one can sue, not the women whose rights are most directly affected, not the providers who have been chilled in being able to provide those women with care, and not the United States in this suit. They say that federal courts just have no authority under existing law to provide any mechanism to redress that harm. And if that is true, if a state can just take this simple mechanism of taking its enforcement authority and giving it to the general public backed up with a bounty of $10,000 or $1 million, if they can do that, then no constitutional right is safe. No constitutional decision from this court is safe. That would be an intolerable state of affairs, and it cannot be the law. Our constitutional guarantees cannot be that fragile, and the supremacy of federal law cannot be that easily subject to manipulation. So we would ask this court to hold that the United States can proceed with this action and affirm the preliminary injunction entered by the district court and immediately vacate the stay that the Fifth Circuit entered in this case so that Texas cannot continue to deny women in its borders a right protected by this court's precedents one day longer. Thank you, counsel. The case is submitted. The case is submitted. If they can do this, then no constitutional right is safe. No constitutional decision from this court is safe. That would be an intolerable state of affairs. It cannot be the law. Our constitutional guarantees cannot be that fragile. She was sworn in as Solicitor General of the United States on Friday. This was her day at work at the Supreme Court today. Joining us now is our friend Dahlia Lithwick. She is senior editor and legal correspondent for Slate.com. She's the host of their Amicus podcast. Dahlia, it's great to see you. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. As somebody who knows these cases and the um, expectations for these arguments, um, like the back of her hand, I just wanted to hear from you today. I know that you were able to listen into the arguments as we all were. It is amazing to be able to hear them live and in real time as oral arguments, even when we can't be there in person. What did you think? Well, First off, I just want to point out that that summation that you just played by the brand new Solicitor General really ticked off boom, 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 the way she peeled off three of the conservative justices today. She mentioned a million dollars, the quote unquote bounty uh, that is $10,000. Uh, it was Chief Justice John Robert who brought up the hypothetical what if it's ten? What if it's a million dollars? Would that change things? Then she ticked off. What about gun owners? Can you go after them? That was Brett Kavanaugh's concern. And third, she went right to Amy Coney Barrett's concern with this case, which is people cannot effectuate their rights in the Texas state courts uh, if this law is allowed to stand. So she just absolutely masterfully, I think. It was a magisterial kind of pulling in all of the doubts of the three justices. She only really needed two of them, but I think that what you saw right there, what you heard right there, was her being so attuned to the weak spots in Texas's argument and then saying, come sit by me, Justice Kavanaugh, come sit by me, Justice Barrett and the Chief Justice. I think we could get to five to strike down this law. It was really a tour de force. Um, what do you make of the fact that this was heard so quickly by the justices? Does that also tell us anything about how they are inclined? Why do you think they made the decision that they would hear this so quickly? I mean, a 10-day turnaround in terms of getting oral arguments is just unheard of. 
Rachel, I've been calling that shadow docket decision that let the law go into effect in September the biggest self-own, a totally unnecessary self-own by the conservatives on the court. They know that Jackson, the, the case that's going to be argued one month from today on December 1st, could have been the vehicle to erode Roe. Why do it in this sloppy, slapdash way that allows Texas to sort of single-handedly overturn Roe. And so I think what you saw happen was a huge outcry across the country about the shadow docket, how this happened at midnight with a paragraph unsigned order that women and pregnant people in Texas were suffering uh, uh, outcomes from being denied abortion, and then the polling around the court that just cratered after this. And what you saw, I think, was on a dime, the court saying, hmm, maybe we should have heard this. Maybe this should have been argued and briefed, and we should have treated this as though it is a serious constitutional problem. So yes, it was a very short turnaround. The court um, really calendared this with 10 days to get it briefed and argued. As you said, we haven't seen that since Bush v. Gore. But nothing has changed on the ground, I think, except that the court looks really, really dumb for letting Texas, hmm. in effect, make the court look weak and frail. And so, so that's why I think with two months after, the court said, we better hear this as though it's serious, because you know what? It's kind of serious. Do you think that the quick turnaround in terms of them hearing it means that we'll also have a quick ruling? I think so. I think we'll have a quick ruling. And let's be really clear, because I think we haven't said it, this is not a decision on the merits. This goes to hmm. nothing that has to do with whether Roe and Casey are good law. That's coming in Dobbs. That's coming in a month. But I think for the court to save face, they can at least say, maybe Texas shouldn't be allowed to make us look stupid in the future. We'll get to the merits of Roe very, very soon.